Words are really powerful. Writing things down is very powerful. Reminders are powerful. Visual imagery is very powerful. So don't underestimate the power of, uh, of reminding yourself of why you're, why you're still doing what you're doing and that you are capable. Hello and welcome to another vlog on YouTube and podcast on Spotify by the Fit Minds Podcast. Coach Mariah here. Hopefully you can hear me with my little mic over here. <laughs> it's very odd when you try and put it into the right position and you think, I wonder how this audio is going to turn out. So today we're going to be discussing binge eating cycles and specifically repairing our relationship with food. Um, I have to note before I begin the podcast that as a nutritionist, we don't typically work with people as deeply um, on a level with behavioural eating. That's generally something that we refer outwards to a psychologist who specialises in the field or a dietitian or both. Um, so in most instances where someone comes to me with um, an eating disorder, an actual diagnosed eating disorder or a histi history thereof, we have to then look at obviously what we can do um, with regards to referring out. But for this podcast and for the purpose obviously of the topic, I'm speaking in generalities. So this won't be individualised, but... I kind of wanted to produce this podcast in a way to provide a tool to help some people who might be struggling with binge eating cycles already in a way that you know may not necessarily be specific to them but it might just be able to spur you know some a little bit of inspiration I suppose for helping the situation in the meantime before they then um, get a little bit further professional help. But uh, today I'm going to speak from perspective of specifically those who exercise, um, so athletes and disordered eating patterns, because that's what I've studied in my postgrad and that's where my scope um, covers. Um, however, obviously we know it's quite common for people to struggle with binge eating um, and I'll also differentiate the difference between binge eating and excessive snacking, which I think people get confused about. Um, but I really do just want to stress that if you have uh, you know, binge eating disorder or you think that you've got um, a serious mental health uh, concern and this is if it is impacting your mental health on the daily, uh, your lifestyle etc, then you, you do need to get professional help from a psychologist specifically, a dietitian, perhaps, um, but somebody who can help you out with the emotional side of that binge eating process. Um, so first of all, uh, before I get started by the way, sorry I'm not wearing makeup today, um, I'm 34 weeks pregnant and makeup is optional <laughs> and uh, we had a scan this morning and found out that our, our baby is breech at 34 weeks which is not ideal so uh, today it is not an option for me to put makeup on I'm just going to present uh, as I do and, and something that I'm good at is being able to deliver uh, content no matter what I look like so of course I'm going to try and define a couple of reasons as to why we might get stuck in binge eating cycles or you know, where binge eating can come from um, and then go from there. So obviously emotional reasons, you know, and that's why I mentioned that binge eating, sometimes think, people think that it's a nutritionist's job to address this or a dietitian's job to address this. Yes, obviously if a dietitian has worked with someone who struggled with binge eating disorder or even myself, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa when I was younger and binge eating was in there. So. I went through multiple binge eating episodes whilst I was bulimic. There is this assumption that people who are fit, skinny, you know, lean or whatever, that they can't struggle with binge eating and that's not true. Just uh, because somebody appears a certain way doesn't mean that they you know, aren't struggling with a particular um, eating disorder or disordered eating pattern. It's all very complex. So even though I struggle with this personally, I'm not going to talk about my personal journey with binge eating and recovering from that because I don't think it's relevant in this podcast. And certainly I don't want people thinking that I'm going to compare their you know, um, experiences to mine. But I have recovered. So it took me about two to three years, um, at least a good two years to recover from the binging and bulimic episodes. And then three years um, kind of to recover from anorexia and, and even longer, maybe even four to five years to recover from, even six years plus to recover from issues with weighing myself excessively, etc. So long process for myself, that's the experience, but again, very different for everybody. And this is why I can't stress enough that it's important people get the professional help that they need from, from uh, psychologists specifically more than counsellors because they do have the ability to, to tackle these 
these troubles. Um, so obviously emotional reasons is, is going to be one of the major you know, red flags as to why someone might be struggling with binge eating. It's not just going to be that reason. It may not be you know, for that reason as well. They may not be eating out of comfort or binging out of comfort. So that's kind of just one of the reasons or contributing factors. Um, and then obviously there's things like restricting calories excessively, which this one I don't think people think about often enough or even don't give it enough credit. But this is, weirdly enough, I actually had myself the experience of the emotional and the restriction. So um, both were leading into and over-exercising and you know, basically doing too much, not eating enough. And then on top of that had the emotional triggers. So, but restricting calories, so dieting really heavily, something I've seen very often in the industry is that clients are coming to me on very low calories, they're really struggling to stick to them. Um, you can see this in things like comp prep scenarios as well, when calories get quite low, some people will and can go into binge eating episodes, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, there are risk factors involved in heavy dieting. And unfortunately, this is very counterproductive because if you think about it when you're dieting, last thing you want to do is consume large amounts of calories in, in a single sitting or in, you know, a day's uh, effort. Um, but restricting calories excessively or for prolonged periods of time and or both, okay? So generally you'll find that this gets worse the longer you do it. Uh, or particular food groups excessively. So we see on the internet the whole keto uh, thing <laughs> that's still floating around. Low carbohydrate diets, low fat diets, particularly low fat, particularly low carb and all and or low protein diets so even veganism and vegetarianism can see that sometimes unfortunately will lead to binge eating episodes because you're not getting enough of the things that you need the macronutrients you need so basically excluding food groups um, sometimes you can see this as well for example if someone has said you know all bread is bad or all ice cream is bad so then they end up not just excluding say like carbs as a whole or protein as a whole but or, or fats as a whole but they are looking at uh, demonizing certain food groups, processed foods altogether. So for example, they might cut them out and say, well, I'm not going to eat these at all, uh, which is often a common mistake when it comes to binge eating or having trouble with trigger foods. And as a result, unfortunately, then it becomes this thing that they then desire even more. So very complex though. Um, and that's why going through the process of things like food reintroduction, all that type of stuff is important to do with a psychologist and a dietitian, especially if you've got to the point where you are you know getting anxiety about certain foods and and the like and that's when it's it's gone beyond something that is as simple as changing your macros and following a plan um another one i see is fasting so fasting for prolonged periods of time there's fasting is really popular at the moment i, I still don't know why um, there's no sort of evidence not solid evidence to support yes there are obviously some pos positive things that can happen from fasting but there's actually a whole lot of negative things negative things uh, that can occur from the fasting process itself, including things like atrophy, muscle wastage, you know, micronutrient deficiencies, um, dropping in blood sugar and then spiking blood sugar um, you know, when you do feed again. So the concept of fasting um, really doesn't have any sort of uh, solid backing as to why it would work other than closing the window when you're eating. So making your, apparently it's to make you less hungry in that short window of eating. Um, however, we know that as nutritionists, one of the best things we can do for our clients is encourage them to eat frequently, not, you know, every hour, but every three to four hours. The recommendations is three main meals and two, one to two snacks either side. Uh, you can eat up to six times a day, so three mains and three snacks, and that just helps to balance blood sugar. Also helps with protein replenishment and carbohydrate replenishment in that it helps to repair your muscle tissue slowly as the day goes on, because as, as human beings, if you think about it, we don't just operate in four hours, we have an entire day's worth of activities, movement, thought, etc., etc. So the, the carbs and fats and protein serve a purpose, it's kind of like a conveyor belt as the day goes on, and that drip feed process is actually quite beneficial. And carbs, energy, obviously. So if you go in these big windows and you're fasting, you're thinking, I want to be in ketosis, and I've talked about this in previous podcasts, but there's no difference between fasting being in a calorie deficit when fasting, so eating less calories overall, and being in a calorie deficit and eating more frequently. It, it, it basically, the energy balance works out the same across the day. So it's all numbers in, numbers out. But uh, fasting, so fasting can lead to binge eating episodes, because obviously, if you think about it, if you haven't eaten for a while, blood sugar drops, you go to eat again, hunger hormones spike when we start eating, uh, especially if you haven't eaten for a prolonged period of time. 
and uh, unfortunately that can then lead to you know an excess of hunger hormones uh, and difficulty finding the satiation point so where you're feeling satisfied because you've gone that long window and it's actually a built-in mechanism for us to uh, almost gorge ourselves when we have gone for prolonged periods of time without food simply because if you think about it you know if we were out in the wild I know I hate using this analogy but you didn't have food for a prolonged period of time what would you naturally do in a situation where there was lots of food available you know what would the body be pre-programmed pre to do in a situation where there wasn't really enough there and you know they knew that okay at that point we're, we're gonna have to eat as much as possible before we run out of food again um, and other animals, you know, like obviously there are other animals that fast for particular periods of time, but again, human beings were not really designed to fast for long periods of time and to diet for long periods of time because of what we've seen in things like metabolic adaptation, hunger hormones uh, and the like, which actually change as a result of the way that we are treating our bodies. Um, different calorie requirements, okay, we need to talk about that. There are different requ calorie requirements for different people. And so this is where a lot of people get stuck confused um, they might you know think to themselves well if I just eat as little as possible I'll lose more body fat faster one of the biggest mistakes I've seen is that people will track their calories on my fitness pal put their goal into my fitness pal and this is so important that people understand this and they might go I want to lose a kilo a week no idea why they say that but you know apparently a kilo a week is the round number that everybody wants to lose not realizing that weight loss or fat loss more specifically should be a percentage of body weight not just a kilo a week um, because there is a safe rate of loss, okay? And um, in the instance of my fitness pal, you might go, okay, well, my goal is to, to lose a kilo a week and I want to do that by, you know, six weeks because I'm in a rush because everybody's impatient these days and they want to, you know, have it done overnight. In that instance, my fitness pal is basically designed to spit these calories out that it, you know, has designed for that particular rate of loss but it's not within safe measures. It's not within you know, what's optimal for keeping you satisfied from hunger. It's not optimal for preventing muscle wastage. It's not optimal for micronutrient values. So all it is is a calculation. All it's saying is, well, you know what, if we reduce all these calories out of this person's diet, you know, they could lose a kilo a week. We can't guarantee that that kilo isn't gonna come from muscle tissue and fat. So, you know, this assumption that MyFitnessPal setting your calorie goals for you is a good idea is, uh, it's false. Unfortunately, it's just not gonna help you out. So this is why you need a nutritionist to help you out. So they can figure out, number one, what rate of, rate of loss should be, okay, for your body weight, a, a safe rate of loss, and it's gonna be a percentage as I mentioned. The other factors to consider is obviously um, the timeline. So why are you in such a rush? We shouldn't be rushing a dieting process. It should be gradual because it is safer. It is uh, much more beneficial for being able to stay satisfied and feel, you know, not feel starving every second of the day. And so this is often why when I go into a dieting phase with a client, they might say things to me like, I feel like I'm eating too much food or <laughs> I feel full, I feel satisfied. Wow, there's so much food. I, don't, I didn't realize I had to eat so much. And the, the thing is, is that this will lead me into my next point. A lot of people are eating used to eating either next to no calories, so you know, starving while they're dieting, and unfortunately then leading into this sometimes binge eating cycle, which is you know, an indication we might need to increase their calories a little bit, make it a bit more reasonable, do it across a longer length of time. Um, so they get stuck in that, or, and the next point is that they might be eating too many what's called high energy dense foods. So, uh, I've talked about this in other podcasts, but basically things like a cup of spinach, 10-15 calories, a cup of peanut M&Ms, <laughs> it's a couple hundred calories, if not more. And so that's the concentration of the calories in that particular food item. Doesn't make it a bad food item, just means that they're dense in energy. You know, tablespoons of peanut butter, tablespoons of olive oil, they would seem to be healthy, but they're dense in energy because their fats are dense in energy. So, um, but you see with the Western diet, high energy dense foods, they're everywhere. You know, oils added to things, bacon, which has added oil, um, you know, very fatty cuts of meat, which the fat, the animal fat is going to contain a higher amount, higher amount of calories than a low fat cut. Um, and lots of different instances of things like potato chips, you know, yeah, you've got the carbs in there, but then you've got the added fats that they've been cooked in, the oils, um, you know, baked things as well, croissants, you know, lots of different yummy things that have added oils 
and sometimes added concentrated sugars. So you might have a tub of Ben and Jerry's, first ingredient is liquid sugar. It's delicious obviously, Ben and Jerry's. But then you've got another tub of ice cream that might have half as many if not a quarter of the calories that, you know, the, the energy requirement that what, sorry, energy amount that what Ben and Jerry's does. It's like the same amount, the same volume. How is that, how is that a thing? And that's because obviously Ben and Jerry's has a higher sugar content. So what they can do with sugar is boil it down to a liquid, okay, and then they can concentrate it again and again and again to make it sweeter and sweeter, but it will still contain those calories that it originally had. So high energy dense foods are, foods are everywhere. You only need to look in a lot of packets and they're probably going to be there. And uh, fatty cuts of meat, cheeses, um, the like, you know, you're going to have, they're going to have a decent amount of calories. Low fat versions may not, they may have less. Okay. And in which case, in that instance, um, you know, this is where we can make some recommendations with lower energy dense foods with regards to if you are going to go into a dieting phase, you can still feel just as full from fruits and vegetables, etc. Um, from these these foods that don't have a lot of these, you know, I've talked about hidden calories in a previous podcast, but, and then still feel like, hold on, I don't feel like I'm dieting. I don't feel like I'm hungry all the time, I'm starving all the time. So it explains why you could have one McDonald's meal and a packet of chips a day, or you could have three Macca's meals and a packet of chips a day. And you could still, let's say, uh, or it might be a few more, it might be a soft drink. And you see it's still meeting your calorie requirements of, to maintain your body weight, but you're still hungry. So then you continue to eat because they're not satiating foods. They don't satisfy you and they're called high energy, high energy dense foods for a reason. They have lots of energy in them in a small amount of space, uh, but they may not actually fill you up for as long and they may not digest as slowly either. Um, a few other major reasons, um, you know, that we could be experiencing or going into binge eating episodes. And again, this is can be, this can be like overlapping multi, multi-layered, right? Not enough sleep. Um, so we do find that with lack of sleep or sleep deprivation, even a small amount, we have what's called insulin resistance, which kicks in. It's just literally basically your body having trouble recognizing energy that you're eating, uh, so food as energy for your body to utilize. And so this is where there's just that disconnect with an insulin response. So when we talk about insulin, the biggest impact on insulin response, uh, one of the biggest fact, uh, impacts more than fasting, more than, you know, any sort of fandangle thing you can take. Um, is actually going to be your sleep. And it's one of the leading causes or contributors towards diabetes. So, and that's um, you know, going to be diabetes, it's onset later in life. So sleep is a big one. So if you're currently not getting, as a, as a male, seven to eight hours, and as a female, eight to nine, you definitely are sleep deprived, and that could be contributing towards these excessive hunger levels, especially if you're dieting. So not feeling satiated, not feeling satisfied from your meals as the day goes on. And you'll often know this because you'll, you'll feel it. Um, and back to obviously the point I was mentioning before, you know, for each person, with that MyFitnessPal situation of calculating your calories for you, and probably most of us have probably done this and gone, oh shit, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that's actually pretty dangerous. Um, I was the person who fell into that. I, you know, that's pretty much how my eating disorder developed was, again, it's, you know, other reasons, but... I used my fitness pal to calculate my calories and they were always too low when I was exercising too much and that's where it kind of started. That's what lit the fire for me. There are different calorie deficit requirements for people, okay? So depending on everything from uh, lots of different factors, including energy ex uh, expenditure, height, weight, whether you're a male or female, your activity levels, etc., like the list goes on. There are so many different uh, contributing factors to what your calorie intake should be in a deficit. What I've found really commonly is that women who, for example, might sit up in the 80, 90, 100, 110 kilo mark, they might think, well, if I just eat as little as possible, my body will survive off my body fat um, if, they, if they've got a bit of body fat to lose. And unfortunately, they don't have the education or at least no, no one's you know, born like this to know this. You've got to go and seek out professional help to understand that their calorie requirements are not going to be 1,500 or 1,400 calories. You know. Um, as you go up in weight, 80, 90, 100, 110 kilos, your metabolic rate increases because you, because you have more weight to move around. So if I was to strap a 10 kilo backpack on my back, that's going to increase you know, how hard my heart has to work to move my body around. And so in this case, if you've got a female or a male, it doesn't matter, but if they're in the 90, 100, 110 kilo mark, you know, if you've got them down on 1500 calories a day, calories are too low. So this is where, unfortunately, we can see that um, 
we're exacerbating or even encouraging the binge eating cycle to occur because they just aren't satisfied from their food because they're carrying around the extra body weight which actually requires heart rate to work a bit harder than someone who might weigh a little bit less than, than that. So the less we weigh, basically the less we naturally burn moving around. Um, and obviously that's why calorie requirements change as we lose weight as well. So now you understand as we gain weight, the, the calorie deficit changes and as we lose weight, it, it changes as well. And depending on how much muscle mass you've got, that'll change your metabolic rate too. Every kilo of muscle mass burns an extra 50 calories just re at rest every day for you. How cool is that? So also your energy expenditure, you know, that's going to influence. So if you've got a really high step count, you're a nurse or something, or doing 20,000 steps a day and you're dieting and you're on 1,400 calories, you're like, why am I so hungry? Your activity levels are really high. You need to compensate for that. So your deficit will be slightly higher because you're moving all the time. You're using more energy. And it's not something that you need to just leverage all the time and say, well, because I'm moving more, I'm burning more, that's a great thing, I'll just eat less. Again, there is this little sweet spot where the deficit is not too low, where you end up being tempted to binge, you're malnourished, etc. But it's not so high that you're not losing any body fat at all. Um, also, whether you're a male or female, so that influences things. Um, obviously, testosterone and the male endocrine profile favours a slightly higher metabolic rate, but again, that's one of the factors that helps to influence uh, their fat burn burning capabilities. Um, so I guess now you understand that calorie deficits is not just 1,200 calories, it's not just 1,400 calories, it's not just, oh, I'll just eat 1,500 calories. It's not, you, you don't even know how much protein, fats or carbs you require either because, again, that's going to be calculated for you by a nutritionist based on your individual needs. And so we need these factors to decide this for you. That's why finding it on the internet is not actually very useful at all. Finding it on an app, not useful at all. So a couple more reasons. As I mentioned earlier, not enough protein. Protein is the most satiating macronutrient group that exists, so it helps to keep you fuller for longer. Most of Gen Pop is not eating enough protein as it is. They think protein is just for muscle building. Yes and no. It's a muscle replenishment. So the muscle tissue that already exists in our body, whether it's for lifting things or not, you have muscle tissue. You need protein to replenish that. So we find an aging population there's a protein resistance that starts to occur as we age and commonly they're already under eating protein they continue to under eat it their appetite goes down protein goes down again and they end up atrophying even further and this is where we see increased risks of falls breaks etc etc because their muscle tissue is wasting away also not using the muscle tissue but if they're not eating the protein to literally build the muscle tissue or at least replenish the turnover and that's what our muscle tissue does it breaks down and it rebuilds, even if we're not exercising, right? Uh, then that's where we see this, this, this risk of atrophy. So um, protein, it fills us up, okay? It is something that fills us up. It keeps us fuller for longer. And it's what we want if we have got a protein requirement that someone can calculate for us. You bet you want, you're going to want to hit that. So under consuming your protein, there's no benefit to doing that. Um, recommendations are generally 1.6 to up to 2.8 times body weight, but you know sits between that 1.6 to 2.2 up to 2.5 when dieting uh, times body weight and protein in grams per day. Might may not make much sense to anyone who's not tracking their macros, but um, if you're under consuming that protein intake, and this is more common for vegetarians, vegans, or those who just don't particularly like protein, meat, dairy, etc., um, you will find that unfortunately, you know this will then increase your hunger. Um, cues. Protein is a macro, the macronutrient that fills you up the most for the longest, slow digesting. Um, and so this is why a lot of the time, yeah, when, when clients diet with me, they go, huh, oh, I'm feeling really satisfied and full. Are you sure that I'm dieting? And it's because they're just not used to eating protein and they're not used to the fact that feeling full is a good thing. Being hungry all the time is not a good thing because this is where we can see that this binge eating type of behavior can sometimes creep back in. Um, not eat enough fiber. So fiber is contained in plants, fruits, vegetables, uh, grains. You know, so we don't find fiber in meat, in dairy. Fiber is in what grows from the ground. Okay, and so fiber actually helps to move um, our digestive matter, so what's called chyme, through our intestines, and it also helps to fill us up. So when it's in your tummy, have you ever noticed you have a big bowl of veggies, or you've had dinner and there's a heap of, you know, nutrients in there? Um, have you ever noticed 
that you feel fuller, you feel more satisfied. Potato satisfies you more than, for example, potato chips because, again, it's going to have a higher content of fibre. Um, a lot of the time when we cook and process things, we can actually reduce that fibrous amount. Blending stuff as well, you know, you're actually then... But the fibres still exist, but your body isn't, isn't having to work so hard to break it down. So this is why, in a natural form, fruits and vegetables, grains, etc., they're very beneficial and hitting a fibre intake. Recommendations stand at uh, 25 grams of fibre minimum for women daily and 35 grams for men. I like to sit my clients a little higher, um, but if you're going 50 grams, 60, 70 grams, too much fibre. <laughs> uh, you may have some digestive trouble. But under 25 grams, you'll see that you just won't feel as full uh, and your digestion, you know, you may have trouble with digestion as well. And this is, as I said, where you can lead to these excessive binges or more binge eating patterns and behaviours. So not drinking enough water, okay, is a big one. Um, if you find that you are, you know, excessively hungry all the time between meals, but you're only drinking a litre of water a day, it's literally one of the most biggest contributing factors towards people snacking and, and overeating or even, you know, getting stuck in binge eating cycles. It's not going to be the main reason, but it can contribute, you know, especially if we are emotional, we're not drinking water, we don't think about that. So this is where sometimes, unfortunately, people will read, uh, reach for, you know, um, binging on something as opposed to just having a big glass of water and satisfying their hydration. I've talked about this in previous podcasts, but same signals are sent to your mouth when you're hungry as when you're thirsty. So sometimes we get confused between this hunger and thirst signals and sometimes we really just need to drink some water. Recommendations for water intake is two litres for a sedentary individual, someone who sits, doesn't do anything all day. Um, but three, four litres for someone who's more active um, and even upwards from there, five, six for people who are tradies and also training at the gym every day. So again, water intake is actually dependent on each person's activity levels. But two litres is never enough if you're an active person or if you're at least getting off your chair every day. So uh, drinking your calories is another big one. As I mentioned, these high energy dense foods, which would include liquid calories such as alcohol, juice, soft drink, etc. So um, some people will find that they will drink and then they'll also eat at the same time. Obviously, some people say they don't eat when they drink and that's fine. Whatever, like it doesn't matter. I'm not, you know, going to get into specifics. But alcohols won't, you know, alcohol won't fill you up. So... Um, people will often be drinking the calories they're also eating. So, and then sometimes, for example, if they're drinking the calories all day, soft drink, alcohol, whatever, they may get really hungry and then this may facilitate more binge eating episodes because they're not satisfied, as I mentioned, from fibrous foods, you know, um, complex carbohydrates, uh, decent amount of protein, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, lack of exercise. Sometimes people, for example, might not be exercising, they might be sedentary, this may feed into binge eating or having trouble with controlling hunger hormones. You find that, have you ever noticed if you sit down all day, you know, sometimes you can get uncontrollably hungry along with all the other reasons why it could be contributing, but you're not enough water, not enough fiber, not enough protein, not enough micronutrient density, you know, fruits and vegetables are things that actually help to give us energy, etc., and make us satisfied, make our bodies happy. If you're sitting down all day, um, that can actually unfortunately then lead to things like boredom or, you know, thinking more about food. So if you, sit, for example, go out for a walk or you're going to exercise, the great thing about exercise is that it can act somewhat as an appetite suppressant. Origin, like eventually your appetite will go back up after exercise, but whilst exercising, your body is focusing on exercising. So it's like, I wouldn't condone every time you feel like having, you know, an excess amount of food, you know, going for a big sprint or a run or anything to try and cope because that can then lead to over-exercising and, and, you know, using exercise as a coping mechanism more than just daily enjoyment and exercise. But I do suggest that if you aren't exercising, you know, three or four times a week, if you're not walking enough, if your steps are you know, under three, four thousand a day or even under five thousand, that perhaps the, the lack of movement will be contributing towards these episodes. And this is why we encourage going out for a walk when you do feel like you're getting close to having having one of them, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so obviously, I want to talk about breaking the cycle, okay? You know, I've talked about reasons why we might be binge eating. There's honestly a plethora of other reasons, but these are just some of the ma major ones. Breaking the cycle obviously starts with recognising it, um, and obviously if you've got a poor relationship with food, you know, there may be layers, lots of layers as to what's going on here. And it, again, as I said, it can be so complex from person to person, 
depending on their history of dieting, depending on the history of, of eating. Um, but most importantly, you know, it is about forgiving yourself before or after, during, whatever it might be. Don't beat yourself up if you're going through binge eating episodes. It actually doesn't help. So um, I've seen this with clients, I've seen it with myself, that the self-loathing and the self-punishment um, unfortunately just seems to feed back into it or even so, like if you think about it, being nasty to yourself, and I've said this in many podcasts, it doesn't actually help you move forward. It doesn't help you get better. It doesn't help you become solutions focused. It doesn't help you come to a resolve, you know what I mean? It's just this kind of very harsh tactic that people use internally, which is awful to watch and obviously to go through. So don't beat yourself up. Forgive yourself as quickly as you can, okay? The reset button is amazing. I think when talk, people talk about reset, I don't mind talking about it saying, look, I've just got to reset and start on Monday. I don't believe in that. I think your reset can happen whenever you want it to. You could have just gone through an episode or struggled with something and taken a big deep breath, talk to somebody about it, um, use some of the, the tools that I might mention in a second and, uh, and then reset, you know. And so that's part of forgiveness. That reset is actually forgiving yourself. It's not just about forgetting, but forgiving and letting go of it and not holding it against yourself, not, you know, um, using words or terminology that might make you feel even worse. And they do. It always does make you feel worse. It makes you feel like it's almost like you're feeding that monster a little bit more. So, yeah, one of the biggest pieces of advice I ever got was forgive yourself, be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself. I know it sounds really cliche, but until you start to use that voice, uh, the cycle can unfortunately repeat and start back up again uh, and be fed into for sure and it is easier said than done to be kind to yourself um, but there's that conscious practice of it that will definitely be of great assistance in this particular um, instance every day is a new day in tying in with that this concept is really helpful for people who struggle with repeated uh, even like because you know binge eating and binge eating cycles can be addictive and I know that because I was addicted to the, the rush of it, okay? Um, and that's why I try not to talk too much about that because it's still such a double-edged sword. As addictive as it is, it came with some awful side effects. You know, my teeth were starting to rot away at the back. I was getting a lot of um, issues with acidity, reflux, all that type of stuff. There's just hair loss, you know, uh, that was of bulimia. Uh, and stretching your stomach, the discomfort of, you know, over-consuming calories and over-consuming food in, in, in episodes. And as I mentioned, there is a difference between binge eating, which is eating to the point of feeling sick or pain, okay, um, excessive amounts of calories, just, you know, not thinking about it, just shoveling it in, uh, whether it's in a sitting or a whole day, and then snacking, excessive snacking, and that's just literally just eating extra things outside of your plan or, um, you know, eating a couple of extra things or extra helpings and servings than you had originally planned. So binge eating is not snacking, excessive snacking. Binge eating is, is to the point of usually of discomfort or to the point of like your body doesn't need any more food and yet you're still, you're still there putting it in there. Um, but every day is a new day. That type of concept is very helpful, okay? So you might wake up in the morning and go, right, whatever happened yesterday happened yesterday. Or even whatever happened this morning happened this morning, but there's nothing stopping you from making that change in the moment or after, upon reflection or the next day. You don't need to wait for a new week or a new month. You don't need to write off a whole week. There is nothing that's going to benefit you in doing that because, again, that can feed back into it. So that's why this patience process of, you know, stop, reflect, um, forgive, restart as quickly as you can is incredibly helpful for this particular struggle. Uh, knowing your triggers and self-reflection. So obviously knowing, look, I can't list them off. It could be anything. You, you're going to know what usually sets you off, writing them down, talking to a professional about them, whether it's, for me, it was being alone. It used to be being alone. Um, also, you know, in an abusive relationship that I used to be in, that would trigger it. So, and then obviously being able to work with a professional and figuring out how to remove the triggers Okay, work on them, um, know them, manage them, know what to do when they pop up because you can't always remove them and the list goes on. But again, this is something a psychologist can help you do. It's not something that I should be doing as a nutritionist and you shouldn't rely on your coach or your nutritionist to do this for you. This is, this is some bigger stuff. 
um, because if it is tying into emotional triggers, um, or if, for example, particular food types are triggering you, that's where we can do like slow reintroduction of food types, especially if you've been restricting for prolonged periods of time or extra, extra calories. Um, but again, psychologically, getting assistance from a psychologist or a counsellor in conjunction with working with a nutritionist and dietitian with slow introduction of, reintroduction of foods, that can work as well. So sometimes it just depends on your circumstances to what type of help you need. Um, Self-reflection is not the same as self-deprecation. I've said this in previous podcasts. Beating yourself up, being nasty to yourself, that's not self-reflecting. Self-reflecting is very difficult to do neutrally, but is incredibly beneficial when you decide to do it neutrally. So being able to put yourself into a position where you know that you can think about what's been happening for you. And again, this is where journaling can be really super helpful, but having that conversation with yourself is where it starts. And self-reflection, we do it in our careers, we do it in, or we should be doing it in our relationships. There's lots of other areas of life where we have to reflect. We have to reflect on something that happened, you know, really uh, sometimes decompress, debrief, talk to people about it, whatever it might be. Just, you don't have to talk to people, but journal, you know, talk to yourself about it. But those types of practices post and pre. So um, it's very difficult to do in the moment when it's happening, but before and after, and maybe even before, self-reflection before, oh, I can feel this coming on, you know, what did I do last time for this to, to, to be able to, to cope with this or to, to help with this? Um, can I remember back to a couple of things that worked, you know, and being able to repeat that process a little bit more then. So that's why self-awareness is really important in this too. And again, psychologists, fantastic at encouraging you to do this and, and ways that you can actually... Um, implement self-awareness into everything in your life, not just with your eating. But obviously, there are some, here are some tools, you know, things like journaling, as I mentioned, walking, going for a walk, talking to a friend, starting with the self-talk, but then going, okay, I'm gonna go do something else. Listening to music, so these are all, you know, drawing, fantastic ways to, it's not even about distracting yourself, but taking yourself away from food and the topic of food and taking your, putting yourself towards something that's, you know, could basically keep your mind um, active. If you've already had protein, if you've had a filling meal, if you've, you know, if you've ticked all those boxes, if you're eating enough calories now and you've slept enough and you're hydrated. So let's say you've, you've covered all those bases. It might be that you want to try some of these things to be able to fill that gap. Spending less time in the kitchen or near food when you're feeling anxious. Okay, this one's a big one because I think a lot of people just immediately when they're in these patterns default to going to the kitchen. So remove yourself, go outside, make a, a date with a friend, say, hey, I need to see you. Um, make a date with yourself. You know, go to another room, do something that doesn't involve being in the kitchen. Um, and I think I'm gonna finish up with a couple of really helpful ones. Make a pact or a promise to yourself. Set some goals for improving or moving away from the behavior. Solid goals, write them down. As I said with goals before, they're nothing until they're written down, commit to them. Self-affirmation and support from others makes a huge difference. Self-affirmation and having other people who believe in you and encourage you can be the difference between you actioning something and not. So make sure that you surround yourself with lots of that um, really comfy bubble wrap, <laughs> which I think honestly is how a lot of people get through difficult situations, let alone a behavior that you wanna break. And it's even things like, similar to things like quitting smoking, you know, or drug addiction, etc. When you're wanting to stop doing something that you know is harmful for yourself and, and, and the like, it's not as easy as just, just stop, go cold turkey. We know that. Um, anyone who struggled with addiction would understand that. But we do know that in each process of quitting or removing yourself from something or reducing something or stepping away from something, it's gradual, obviously. Well, sometimes it is instant. I don't know for some people. But with stuff like this, it could be gradual. But along the way, support, putting in lots of support um, and understanding that, you know, if you set yourself up for success as much as possible, things like meal prepping, you know, being, being a little bit more prepared ahead of time, knowing and preempting, going, you know, what, this usually happens maybe this time or on the weekends or whatever, having that really deep insight and then looking into, okay, what can I put in place, you know, now or beforehand, um, whether it be support verbally from other people or written for yourself or verbal for yourself or planning or preparation or talking to a professional, what can I do to prevent and manage? And there's, as I said, many things you can do. Um, 
count how many days you've gone without an episode, okay, as I mentioned, like making this promise to yourself, and try to beat that record. This is something that changed my life when I first started recovering from bulimia and anorexia and binge eating was that I made this promise to myself and I realized I don't like to break promises to myself. I'm very stubborn. And I started a counter on my mirror um, of days, you know, days without a binge eating episode. And I would reset and go back and, you know, get up to 20 and then shit, reset and go back. And I found myself getting really frustrated in the beginning, but then the less I got frustrated and the more I got determined to beat that, the easier it got. It's really interesting. Um, and forgave myself each time. I forgave myself. Okay, beat the last one. Okay, beat the last one. Come on. And sometimes I wouldn't and I'd have to go, okay, beat the, like, beat the big record, beat the big record. And it, this was actually a method that a good friend of mine uh, weirdly one day just mentioned to me when we were going for a walk. She said, try this. And I did, and it worked really well. Um, obviously, it took time. It's not like it worked perfectly the first time. But I kept using that method. And I think we went for a walk again, maybe like a year and a bit later, and she said, how many days out of nowhere? Like, you know, I hadn't even thought about it. And I was like, holy shit, like 360 something. So I guess that was, that was just part of what I did. But again, like, you know, if you're seeing a, a medical or psychological professional, um, they're going to be able to help you with what might tick for you, with what might work for you. And yeah, of course, your friends are going to be able to help you to a certain extent, but don't, don't be complacent in the process. If you've been struggling with this for a long time, if you've sought help from your friends and family, if, you, if you're feeling frustrated and fed up, um, you, you know, you've been dieting for ages or you've, you've tried to nail absolutely everything possible and you're at this point now, this breaking point, you shouldn't even be at breaking point, but getting psychological help. I was with a psychologist for years and it, I can't give you the advice that they gave to me because it's, it's individualistic. That's why psychologists have to treat people separately. Um, set reminders or display affirmations where you can see them, okay, to keep you accountable on track. If it has to be a poster on your wall, if it has to be something you've written on your mirror, on the back of your phone, on your, in your um, background picture, if it has to be a reminder in your phone, a message that you send to yourself, whatever that looks like, but words are really powerful. Writing things down is very powerful. Reminders are powerful. Visual imagery is very powerful. So don't underestimate the power of, uh, of reminding yourself of, of why, you're, why you're still doing what you're doing and that you are capable. Um, and obviously to finish up, and I've said this so many times in this podcast because I cannot stress this enough. If you have listened to this podcast and you've gone, you know what, these are some really helpful reminders that I haven't used before. Um, and also like amongst this as well, I don't want uh, people to come away from this and think, well, I can still keep demonizing food groups and you know, not eating ice cream or not eating this or keeping this completely out of my diet um, because Mariah didn't talk as much about that. But I wanted to focus a little bit more on, I guess, the generalities of what you can do. Definitely not cutting food groups out. You know, that's, that's one big thing is I would say, don't do that. Um, don't cut out carbs, don't cut out protein, don't cut out fats, don't, you know, don't fall into this trap of eating as little as possible don't fall into the trap of fasting. Um, just understand that dieting doesn't have to be this complex. It also shouldn't develop into an eating disorder or binge eating patterns, you know, over exercise, etc. Where I was 11 years ago, it's not healthy to be at that point where you are, you know, constantly binging and, and wondering why. It could be a simple fix. It could be many things contributing. Most of the time, it is complex, but you have to start to think about why, and you have to start to accept why. You have to start to go, okay, you know what? Even though I think I know better, maybe I need to listen to the professionals who've been doing this for years. Seven years I've been in my um, profession and uh, you know, 11 years training, but obviously the first few years of my life when I was, uh, of the training journey, uh, when I was going through those eating disorder struggles, I wasn't aware of any of this, you know, and I didn't have the tools or support, uh, or at least I didn't seek it out and I was very stubborn. And so I would never want anyone else to be in that position that's probably the, the, the final point is, um, you know, don't ever be too stubborn with your, your habits and your obsessions and your goals and things like that to seek help and to accept help and to know that we're not here to sabotage you. We're actually here to save you and, and, and to, to assist you. Um, but yeah, there's no point in us trying to save you if you can't save yourself in the same breath. So that's about it for me. Hopefully this helps a few people in starting to break the binge eating cycle repairing your relationship with food, it definitely all kind of goes together and there's no coincidence that these topics, they're just so interwoven, right, you know? 
Um, food is fuel and is nourishment. It is not something we should use to punish our bodies. We should not be punishing ourselves with depriving calories the next day because we've had a binge or whatever it might be. Um, food is quite simply something that we, we actually have the privilege of consuming every single day and to do that mindfully is uh, you know, incredibly helpful and beneficial for our mental and physical health. Um, on that note though, Chewing your food slower as well can definitely be very helpful, being mindful with uh, you know, your eating processes and, and um, thinking a little bit more about you know, the nourishing side of things. But uh, again, I'll leave that for another podcast on mindful eating, perhaps, um, because again, nutrition is just so complex, so deep, so vast, such a wide array of things we could talk about. If you do ever have any ideas for podcasts and you want me to specifically hone in on those, let me know. Next week, we've got an interview with one of my wonderful clients, Chloe Barwick, uh, winner of wellness, overall winner of wellness MBA, um, the most recent season, 2023 season B, and uh, she was also straight, straight gold medal winner with ICN Queensland and wellness. So definitely somebody to, uh, I guess, aspire to and, and to chat to about normal everyday life stuff as well as uh, bodybuilding. But we'll be on the couch having some chat. So if you've got some questions for her or for myself for that chat, please um, feel free to inbox me. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to doing another podcast for you soon. Bye.